my name is Rick Baskett, and I have an autoimmune disease. Now, this might not surprise you since one in five people uh, suffer from autoimmune diseases. So I'm guessing I'm not the only one here that has to deal with it. Um, for those that need a little bit of clarification, uh, let's see how the dictionary defines an autoimmune disease. A disease in which the body produces antibodies that attack its own tissues, leading to the deterioration, in some cases, to the destruction of such tissue. So I have something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, normal immune systems can tell the difference between foreign cells and your own cells, but for some reason, my immune system uh, mistakes my thyroid as foreign, and it then sends out the troops to attack my thyroid. It's definitely from the fire. Not good. Um, can you imagine what would happen if an autoimmune disease isn't treated? The damage it can do to your body. It can cripple you, but most importantly, it can kill you. As a church, we are doing a series on unity. And today I am speaking to you about the unity of this church in the body of Christ. I really wanted to preach on this topic because each and every one of you are precious to me. Amen. I desire an intimacy with you. And within this church that would allow myself and any one of us to be able to express struggles that we have. And there would be no condemnation. But only, how can we support you and lift you up? Today I would like to explore three things. What happens when, like an autoimmune disease, the body of Christ attacks itself? Why is it important to be unified? And what does it even look like to be biblically unified? Before I proceed, though, I'm going to tell you something that the Holy Spirit brought to my mind not too long ago. And when I've been in conversation with people, it was a concept that they had not thought about and it made an impact on them. So, I'm going to share it with you. You will, or you have already come to a point in your walk with Christ, where you will realize that salvation is no longer important to you. Your focus is no longer on salvation, but the Savior. So let me repeat that. You will, or you have already come to a point in your walk with Christ where you will realize that salvation is no longer important to you. Your focus is not no longer on salvation, but the Savior. Whatever God's judgment is for you, you trust Him. This realization frees you up to serve Christ through love, not fear. I need you to understand this concept. When someone comes here and says, we need to do this or we need to do that, if they're coming from a place of fear that we need to do this or that to be saved, this is legalistic and not the gospel. This is what Paul spoke out against. But if someone comes up front and says, we need to do this or we need to do that and comes from a place of love, then what they are preaching is how to love each other and God better because we are already saved. And we want our lives to say, thank you. This is the place that I'm coming from. Do not think in your minds when I say we need or we should that I'm saying this is how we are saved. There is only one way that we are saved, and that is by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's it. That's when he begins a good work in us, and it's up to him the direction he takes us from there. I am coming from a place of love. I love you guys, and I want us to be the very best family that we can be, Amen. whatever that looks like. We are saved. Yay! Now, what does that look like when we say thank you to Jesus for being our God? What does it look like to live in his kingdom today? So I'm going to spend less time on what it looks like when the body of Christ attacks itself. Sadly, this is not a foreign concept to anyone that I know of. It's actually a point of ridicule among those that are skeptical of the church. Churches have split over the color of the carpet. 
the direction of ministry, how best to worship God, what one person said to another person, the list goes on. People like to believe that the New Testament church had it all figured out. And it makes me wonder, which Bible are they reading? In the book of James, we have problems with false teaching, class distinction, where they were catering to richer members of the church to earn favors or get donated money. There was gossip, seeking and healing through magical ceremonies and incantations. In the New Testament church, this is what was happening. In 1 Corinthians 1, 11, Paul mentions divisions and quarrels. Chapter 5, verse 1 says there was immorality. Chapter 6, verse 1, Christian brothers taking their Christian brothers to court. In Corinth, they had become elitist based on who their leader was and the message of their leader. So they looked down anyone that did not belong to their tribe. The Christian community does this today, except we use denominations. I'm Seventh-day Adventist, I'm Lutheran, I'm Catholic, etc., etc. Many times it's not said in a way that just states the most likely beliefs a person holds, but it's said in such a way that whatever denomination we claim to be a part of, that we are somehow held in higher regard and esteemed by our Lord Jesus and Savior. In Colossians, we have people judging each other based on what people ate or drank religious festivals, Sabbath days, etc., and heresy. Galatians, we had legalism, Philippians, selfish ambition and conflict. And then, Revelation. Oh, Revelation, we're talking some stuff that even makes Jesus want to lie. The body of Christ was a mess. It was an autoimmune disease that was getting out of control. Brothers and sisters in Christ attacking each other to the point that the body was failing. We don't know the motivations of these people. It could have been through good intentions, or through the desire for holiness, or even maliciousness. But we do know that the body of Christ was slowly, and in some cases quickly, destroying itself from the inside. Okay, Rick, we see that there were problems with the New Testament church, but why is unity so important? Good question. In the words of Pastor Brandon Cox, a church divided against itself will plateau, implode, decline, and lose its voice in the community. And sadly, along the way, people get hurt in the crossfire, some of whom will avoid being part of a fellowship of believers again for years, if ever. Without unity, people get hurt. And not a pulling out a wooden splinter in your finger type hurt, but unnecessary, life crippling, potentially eternal, life destroying hurt. Unity matters. Amen. In Ephesians 2 13 through 16. But now in Christ Jesus, you formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God, through the cross, by having put to death the enmity. So why is Christian unity important? Because Christ died to secure the unity of his body. In Galatians 3, 27 to 29. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. Why is Christian unity important? Because Christ died to secure the unity of his body. And as Matthew 19, 6 says, What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. In Revelation 14, 6 through 12, John talks about three angels. The first having a gospel to preach to everyone everywhere. How do we preach the gospel without unity?
unbelieving people will find us simply unbelievable when they see that there is no unity between us. Christ would have died in vain. Without unity, we can't even get past the first angel's message, and we tread on the warning of the third angel's message about worshiping the beast in his image. To foster division, to continually have an us versus them mentality is taking on the image of the beast. Christ came to reconcile us to him. To work against him in this is not the side we want to be on. Okay, Rick. We see how the lack of unity can destroy the body of Christ. And we understand that Christ died to secure the unity of the body. But what does it look like in practice? And really, I'm nothing like you. And why would I want to be like you? I'm not even sure I like you. <laughs> Good question. But ouch, I'm not really that bad. Come on. Let's answer the be like me part first. Unity is not uniform. The beauty of the body of Christ is that it functions as one body, but it consists of different members. There are different parts of that body that serve completely different functions. God loves diversity. In Desiring God by John Piper, he compares the diversity of the body of Christ to a choir. More depth of beauty is felt from a choir that sings in part than from a choir that sings only in unison. Unity in diversity is more beautiful and more powerful than the unity of uniformity. This carries over to the untold differences that exist between the peoples of the world. When their diversity unites in worship to God, the beauty of their praise will echo the depth and greatness of God's beauty far more than if the redeemed were from only a few different people groups. It's okay to be yourself. It's more than okay. It's, it's how God created you. Daniel has taught me a lot about unity. As far as we know, Daniel was blameless and a, and a very godly man. He pursued God even when his life was in danger and sure to die in a lion's den. Listen to parts of his prayer. Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned. Did you hear that? He says, we have sinned. Let's keep going. We have committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. When did Daniel do these things? And would someone that acts wickedly and rebel pray a prayer like this? Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our king, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Let's skip ahead to verse 11. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Daniel does not pray as himself. He prays as a community. He identifies himself as part of the body of Christ. There is no I and me. There is only us. When I speak to God, I, I, I've been trying to practice this, to, to try to pray with a community in mind, to use the word, and to ask for forgiveness for all of us as a group. I try to keep that relationship between all believers in mind. If it's not me versus them, we're in this together. We are a community of believers. We are one bride. No more. No less. Before we started the homeless shelter, we had a vote for anyone that could or wanted to show up to vote. I was really on the I definitely wanted to help the homeless. Ultimately, though, I wanted to do something together as a church, as one body, uh, that still helped the community. Uh, the, the homeless situation was so big, and you know, we're so small. Even when we had evangelistic series, almost no one showed up in this church. Whenever we started something, it just wouldn't have the participation. 
And I am speaking me too. But I am many times I did not participate. And these things would fizzle out. How would we do something like this that was so big? But I came prepared that day that I would put my heart into whatever we decided as a church box. I was prepared to sink or swim. If it was a failure, there wouldn't be any, I told you so. It would be one for all, all for me. That even if it failed, we did it together. And I feel strongly that's the way God wants us to view everything we do as a church body. I don't know if it's in this mindset, not even close. This is just an example that stuck out in my mind because I really didn't think we would stick with this homeless shelter because of our track record, and I was, I was wrong. I was very happy to be wrong. Our history of not following through was broken, and it ended up being an amazing success. Amen. And I know that God blessed it, blessed it greatly. Paul implores those from Ephesus, and it's good advice for us today. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We are called to be humble, to not think of ourselves better than anyone else. We are called to be gentle, to have patience and tolerance. Just a little tolerance. God is doing a good work in each and every one of us. Trust that. Trust Him that He is doing that. There are things that God is working on that you are not able to see in other people. Amen. And those things that you are able to see God most likely cares very little about because there is something so much more important to him. And it's usually those hidden and heart things that he is working on first. Paul is saying that we need to preserve the unity of the Spirit. That means we need to try hard to be at peace with each other. In Colossians 3, 12-17, Paul says, Put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, Humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And above all these, put on the love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. Give thanks through him to God the Father. Paul is saying to the Colossians what he just said to the Ephesians. Compassion, humility, Patience, forgiving each other. How can we call ourselves followers of Christ if we hold grudges? If we do not pursue peace between each other? Paul says to put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So how can we have unity? He says that we need to love each other. But how do we love each other? We need to have compassion for each other. To come alongside each other. Rejoice when others rejoice. Cry when others cry. We need to be kind, humble, gentle, and patient. We need to forgive each other. We are constantly forgiving ourselves, even with simple things. Okay, which dessert should I have? The cheesecake or the brownie? Oh, no, you don't. You don't need a dessert. You've been putting on a lot of weight. What? Who's that? It's me. I mean, you. Okay. If you're going to have anything, have the brownie. The brownie is good. I really do like brownies, but... Mmm. Cheesecake. No, not the cheesecake. It's full of fat. I know. 
It's a simple example, but we have the same dialogue happen when it's about sin. Even when we sin, through Jesus' grace, we eventually forgive ourselves. How much more should we forgive other people? Amen. Recently, I had what I call a God story. It's when I believe God just smacks you upside the head to knock some sense in you. I've got a lot of those in my life. I was getting really frustrated with the elders as I'm sure they were getting frustrated with me. I just didn't understand why they were not bringing something to the table that needed to be discussed. I would pray about it constantly. And then one time while I was praying, that God smack happened. Rick, you are the one that has that something. They can't bring it to the table. You've not been doing what I assigned you to do as an elder. I was shirking from my responsibility because I was afraid. I was afraid of the elders being mad at me. I was wanting me, I was wanting them to let me into the building when I was the one that actually had the keys the whole time. And I was upset about it. It was a humbling experience. So then came the hard part. I needed to confront. And I asked Arlene's permission to share this, and she is the most gracious and humble person I know. She loves you and is willing to do whatever she can to help build up the body of Christ. I needed to confront Arlene. I, I didn't want to. I love her. She's precious to me. And throughout my life, confrontation seldom goes well. But God was calling me to it. And after that, God smacked. I, I knew I needed to do as my Lord commanded because I love her and I want to obey. I confronted her. I wanted her to see that I love her and that I wanted the best for her. And for the church, I held my breath. She had tears in her eyes. Did I hurt her? Did I hurt her relationship? Was it you, God, that told me to do this or was it out of something selfish in my heart. Oh God, please let my motives to be true and pure. She looked at me with tears in her eyes and said, thank you. I know that must have been hard. Thank you. I really appreciate you telling me this. Another God smack, but this time it was so gentle. I was just shown what it was like in God's kingdom. When brothers and sisters devoted to Christ can come to each other in all humility, correct each other, and be corrected, I was able to use my gift of discernment without the other person getting mad at me. I wanted to be that. All I could see was love in Arlen's eyes. Jesus was looking back at me and saying, See, this is what it is like in God's kingdom. I'm not an external cry, but inside I was weeping for joy. This wouldn't have been possible without fellowship. We need to get to know each other before we can love each other effectively. A good definition of fellowship is two fellows on a ship. If one decides to go a different way, someone is going to drown. We are in this together. We are family. Family can have some serious rough patches at times. If any of you have family, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> if two sisters fight, there's absolutely nothing that either can do to change the fact that they remain sisters. We are the bride of Christ. We will be spending eternity together. Jesus said in John 17, 22, 23, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfectly one, or in perfect unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and loved me, even as you loved me. Our unity, or lack of unity, will be noticed by the world. With unity, the world will know that Jesus was sent of God and that he loves them. Without unity, the message we are giving the world is not what any of us wants. I'll end with words from Sky Chitani. 
True unity is not achieved by human effort, but by divine grace. And it does not happen by commitment to the same mission, but by communion with the same Messiah. This coming week, who can you forgive as Christ forgave you? Is there a grudge that you've been holding? Pray about it and talk with the person. The next church event, make sure you come to the event so that you can spend time with your brothers and sisters. If someone does something that you don't like, have compassion on it. Be kind. Be kind to yourself also. God loves you just as much as he loves them. Get to know them in their heart. See them through Christ's eyes and see that they are your brother or sister. You are spending eternity with them. Eternity has already started. It's up to you on how much of God's kingdom you want to participate in. Ask God to teach you how to be unified with the body. There's nothing that God cannot and will not do with a body that is unified. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for the unity of your church. Help us to see ourselves as rays from the one sun, branches of a single tree, and streams flowing from one river. May we remain united to you and to each other, because you are our common source of life. And may we send out your light to pour forth your flowing streams over all the earth, drawing your, our inspiration and joy from the world. Amen.